change lives, change organizations, change organizations, change organizations, change organizations, change the world. The purpose of the talk is to uh, talk basically about the causes of democratic transitions and democratic consolidation. I'm going to present a set of empirical results. So it's a very empirical paper uh, uh, where I basically use a panel data, uh, so countries and uh, years, whether they were democratic or not, from early, the early 19th century, basically 1820, which is when we start to start having uh, income data, which is one of the uh, things I'm going to use, till the end of the 20th century. So this gives us um, a panel again of countries that go from about 20-something countries at the beginning of the uh, uh, 1800s to about uh, almost uh, 190 countries at the end of the 20th century. And uh, what I want to, uh, to talk about is basically to suggest two, two main things. One is that in the long run, um, there is a strong and I would say probably causal relationship between economic modernization and democratization. So development leads to democracy or at least uh, consolidates democracies that may trans countries that may transit to democracy for uh, many different reasons. But uh, at the same time, when we see, uh, when we look at the history of democratization, we see a, a very volatile uh, structure in the data. So there are booms and busts, basically, or waves, if you will, uh, of democratization. And I think that one of the main causes of that, not the only one, um, that, that leads to that volatility is the international environment and needs to be thought about. So the, the behavior of uh, great powers, the relationship between great powers, all these things matter to explain um, democratization. So before I start looking at these two main uh, forces, the international environment and development, I want to share some uh, data on the, uh, the history of democratization. So here, uh, uh, what we see basically is the number of democracies from 1800 till 2007. Um, so there has been a, a progression. It, it looks like liberal, you know, liberal interpretation of history. This uh, an advancement of democracy all the all the way through, with uh, some kind of uh, crisis in the uh, 30s and perhaps you know stagnation in the 60s. The picture though uh, looks a bit different when instead of looking at the number of democracies, we look at the proportion of countries that uh, are democratic or have been democratic, precisely because in the previous graph, uh, a lot of the expansion of democracies comes with expansion of in the number of sovereign actors uh, in, the, in the world. So basically what we see here, uh, sorry, uh, is uh, this is, uh, the proportion of uh, countries uh, that are democratic for each a given year. Democracy basically means, um, in this case, it's coded as participation at at least 50% of the population and having competitive, uh, competitive elections and executives that are accountable to democracies. So what we, uh, we see basically is uh, hardly any democracy at the beginning after 1848, so coinciding with the European spring, if you will, uh, that uh, you know, has some uh, relationship, I suppose, with this, the Arab Spring, what we see is a, uh, a, a progression, the first wave in Huntington terms, that peaks at around 1820, uh, right after World War I. Then there is a uh, collapse in the proportion of democracies going from uh, basically 45% to about 20% at the beginning of World War II. After World War II, there's again uh, a second wave of democratization with a decline that is related, one, to uh, the introduction of to the uh, independence uh, movements and the decolonization uh, of the third world and also to the introduction of a lot of uh, dictatorships in, uh, in Latin America. Then uh, in the 70s, starting in Southern Europe and then moving into Latin America, there is a wave that accelerates in uh, 1990. So there are these, uh, these waves. And you know, just to, uh, to relate to the first point of economic development, what I'm doing here, I'm just uh, drawing, again, the proportion of countries that have been democratic uh, over time since 1800. And then the uh, uh, average world income, um, what we see is a process of growth, of course, uh, with a lot of variance across countries, but in general, development across the world. And there is a, uh, a, a 
some overlap between the two things. So you see democratization and development coming together. But at the same time, as I was saying, um, we see these booms and busts. So it cannot just be, if indeed there is something about development, it cannot be just economic modernization that leads uh, to democracy. And, and we want to, to, to think about, about that. Um, now, um, on the first point of development and democratization, um, there seems to be some relationship just uh, you know, to look at the data in a very general way. This is a graph that has in the x-axis the change in uh, log, ter and log per capita income from 1850 till 1990. And then in the vertical axis, the change in a polity score. Polity score is the score about democratization from zero to, uh, to, to 10 or 20, depending on which one of the polity indices we use. I have uh, normalized it to uh, zero to one. And so what we see, again, this is change also from 1850 till uh, uh, 1999. Uh, what we see is a positive relationship. So those countries that uh, became, uh, that grew and became more developed are also countries that have become more democratic. And those places where growth uh, was uh, absent or very, uh, very uh, low, have also been countries that have hardly democratized, at least during this period of time. Right? Um, now, of course, this is just a correlation. And so uh, one way to think about it is to basically use all the data I was talking about, so using all these panel data of countries and years and uh, with income and whether countries were democratic or not, and run some uh, regressions. Um, basically, what I'm going to... Um, you know, these regressions I'm going to talk about are based on information for every 10 years, whether these countries were democratic or not, and their level of, of development. And what I'm showing here is basically the, uh, the estimate from the regression. And the way to interpret this is basically, this is uh, the increase in democracy in this uh, range from zero to one, zero non-democratic, one completely democratic. What is the impact? according to the estimation of uh, a growth rate for 10 years in a country over a 10 year period. So what is the uh, effect of the growth rate if it is 0% on changes in the democratic score uh, versus a country that has experienced you know, a fantastic growth rate of 10% every year, which is more than doubling the income in 10 years, which is very exceptional. What we see is basically that um, no growth um, is associated with uh, no change in democracy. But for countries that have uh, grown at a fast rate, I'm just talking about a 10-year period, um, the uh, democracy uh, score increases by about 0.2, which, you know, it's uh, quite a bit given that the score, again, the, the, the range, the, to the, the total range is, uh, is uh, one. These are the 95 percent uh, confidence intervals. So we, we sort of are pretty confident that there is some impact of income or at least some strong correlation of income with democracy. Now, of course, the, this correlation that appears, uh, you know, when we, we estimate the data, we, we look at the data, uh, leads us to the question of whether this is a causal relationship or not. So is this just a correlation or is this like some causality going on uh, from development and democracy? And here, I would say there are two types of uh, schools. I would say one is, I would call it the Lipset thesis, where um, development is seen as increasing, for many reasons, the, uh, the uh, likelihood of transiting to democracy uh, directly. Or in some cases, there are some that say, well, perhaps development has a positive impact on democratization, but simply because it stabilizes democracy. So you have transitions to democracy for many different reasons that go from the uh, natural death of a dictator to uh, losing default land wars to any other reasons. And then those countries that are developed for some reasons become democratic and stay democratic, whereas those that are poor uh, do not. That's a way to think about development as causing democracy. Of course, there is the other a thesis, which is basically, I call it the Barrington-Moore thesis, um, that has had, I would say, m more of an impact 
among the economics profession than among the uh, political science uh, the scholarly community. And basically, this thesis says, well, democracy and development may be correlated. We see strong relationships between the two of them, but that's because at some point, especially in Europe, certain types of things changed, basically institutions. Those institutions led both to um, the rule of law and property rights and growth and development, but also to uh, liberal political institutions. Uh, so which one? Um, I particularly prefer to think or uh, try to more or less convince you that there seems to be some causal relationship leading from development to democracy. And why do I say that? Well, you know, just to, I'm going to show some rough data, but look at this uh, graph. This is the level of economic development uh, for the countries for which we have uh, data, basically Madison uh, data, uh, data on per capita income in 1850 and in 2000. Um, this is at the basically start of the Industrial Revolution. And this is uh, basically close to us. There is a very strong relationship. Anyone that had money in 1850 and uh, basically invested in those countries that uh, were already doing slightly better about, you know, had a capita income of about uh, 2,500 would be, you know, extremely rich, about 10 to 15, 10 times, you know, the income versus those that were betting on countries that were already doing not very well then, um, they, they are still not uh, completely developed. So there is a strong relationship. There seems to be something about development and today that is related indeed to something that was already in place uh, 150 years ago. But when you look at democracy, um, what we see, again, this is a graph that shows uh, in the horizontal axis for all these countries, the poverty index uh, normalized from 0 to 1 in 1850, and then the poverty index in 2000, 0 to 1. What we see is basically that in 2000, for these countries, um, most of them are now are democratic. It's not the whole uh, universe of countries since uh, this is based on countries for which we have income data in 1850, but most of them now are democratic, yet in 1850, many of them were not. Okay, so uh, take uh, um, you know, France in, this is 1850, so right before um, um, uh, Napoleon III uh, stage a coup, but so it scores here as democratic. Um, now it is still democratic, uh, as far as I know. Uh, but then you have countries like Japan or uh, even Norway and Sweden that now are extremely democratic, yet they were not in uh, 1850. So again, you know, strong continuities in political, in economic development, probably pointing to something that happened in the past, but not in a uh, in democracy, not in democracy at least as we understand it uh, today with full participation and competitive elections. And so to me this, I think, is the first uh, thing that points to the fact that probably what happened was that as development took place in the sense that it went to, from $2,000, $1,000 per capita at that time to what we know, you know ten to $20,000 per capita income uh, today, democracy for some reasons fell into place. Right? Uh, one way to think about it or to try to, uh, to tease out the data a bit more and to, uh, to, to sort of uh, prove this is to look at uh, separately the effect of development on democracy. So how developed countries were 10 years uh, in the past into democracy at time t, so time now, and then compare these with the effect of how democratic countries were and their impact on development, right? And these again are the estimates. So what we see here is basically, this is basically the same graph I showed before. Um, this is uh, what is the increase in democracy that comes from having 10 years of annual growth from 0% annual growth to 10% annual growth. There is clearly a positive effect. Those countries that 
grow fast and have grown systematically over this 10 year period, um, experience an increase of 0.2 points in the democracy index. Um, and with confidence intervals that are telling us that indeed this seems to be statistically robust, significant. Whereas if you, we look at the impact of democracy in the past on income, on, on the growth rate, what we see is that indeed when you are democratic, there seems to be a positive effect on development. So democratic countries seem to grow faster, but um, there is a, you know, enormous uh, variance. So we are, cannot be certain um, about how robust this result is. So it's unclear that democracy leads to development. It seems to be development that is driving, pushing um, all this change in politics. Uh, of course, you know, I talked about correlation. I tried to kind of uh, talk a bit about causation, given the limits of time, not much. And the question, of course, is what is behind um, this? So what are the mechanisms through which development leads to democracy? And a possible story is that development uh, is indeed a result of these historical forces I was talking about. So these particular constellations of formal and informal institutions that existed or that appeared in Europe, especially in certain, in the medieval uh, times, uh, certain urban and commercial world that developed there, um, those historical uh, institutions or forces led then to different, to a specific growth pattern, the Industrial Revolution, once I think the scientific revolution of the 17th and the 18th century um, um, uh, be, went into full swing. But those uh, structures in the medieval times that led to development did not determine the level of democracy directly. What happened basically is that as development took place, it led then to transformations that led to democracy. So the, perhaps the institutions and the uh, and the uh, kinds of uh, the commercial economy of the past led to the Industrial Revolution. And it's then when you see those changes in terms of more equality, human capital formation, uh, and so on and so forth, that above a certain threshold lead to democracy, democracy as we understand it today. Um, so this much for the, uh, the possible relationship between development and democracy. And as I said, when you look at the data, again, we see this positive trend, but at the same time, there are these booms and busts, right? And so there are different possible stories we, one can tell about why we see this, but it seems to me that the international system must matter. Um, we know that foreign intervention, interventions have a long history, uh, international relations is Students always start with Thucydides and how Athens and Sparta intervened in Corsera and how these, uh, you know, and how they um, meddled in the affairs of the uh, party of the aristocracy and the party of uh, on the Democratic Party and so on and so forth in, in those uh, small places. But also, and this comes, you know, but goes uh, up till now. Um, at the same time, when we look at the data, what is interesting about the data is that the beginnings of these waves of democratization in the 19th century and again after World War I, sorry, and continued with World War I especially, then after World War II and then after in, the, in the last decade of the 20th century, and also the busts coincide with strong realignments in the international system. So basically the collapse of the Holy Alliance, um, the, 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 uh, basically the breakdown of the central empires, the defeat of Nazi Germany, and naturally, you know, the break up of the Soviet Union. So these things seem to have mattered a lot, right? So the question is how to think about the international system. And one way to think about it is to go back to, I would say, realist theories and think about the international system as having these two dimensions or these two components, right? First, anarchy, and second, an unequal distribution of power. So there are the big guys and the small guys, always. And the big guys, the hegemons or the great powers, in this uh, environment, in this anarchical environment, 
with uh, lots of uncertainty and competition, are interested in securing the support of a set of allies. In their, um, and how they are going to go about it and how this is going to affect um, the regime of the political regime, the political institutions on the, of the small guys, particularly, I think is going to depend, or I suggest it depends, on two things. One is on the institutions themselves of the great powers, whether the great powers are democratic or authoritarian, and also uh, it's going to be a function of the structure of the international system, whether the great power is alone, is a hegemon, is not uh, under pressure, and, uh, or whether there are many great powers and you have to move in like in a, in a chessboard and, and do certain types of things. Um, so I'm going to go for the two by two table, which is the, I was told when I was young, is the political science uh, way of theorizing about the world. I'll introduce, you know, subdivision here to make it a bit more, uh, you know, updated and, and a bit more modern. So on the uh, vertical axis, as I said, whether the hegemon or the great power is democratic or authoritarian, and then what is the kind of world where the hegemon competes, whether it's an unconstrained world, so it's uh, a great power that has no competitor, uh, kind of Zeus or Hercules or something like that, or with, whether it's a constrained world with two or more hegemons. And within the constrained world, I think that probably matters whether the, 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 the blocks in the international system are determined by ideology, so you have liberal hegemons versus absolutist or capitalist versus communist, or whether there are cross-cutting alliances. Now, in this context, uh, the authoritarian hegemon that um, rules uh, in an unconstrained world is going to basically support authoritarianism, I think for two reasons. One is that this uh, tyrant in the small country, in the, in the ally, is going to give a lot of stability to the alliance but also because having authoritarian allies in a way allows them to suppress the um, spread of democratic ideas uh, from those allies into the great, in, inside the great power, right? This is basically the situation under the Holy Alliance. Um, the idea, especially after 20, 1821, was to intervene everywhere to make sure by Austria, Prussia, and Russia, to make sure that liberal movements in Italy, the Carbonari, whatever, could then succeed and develop a base from which they can challenge uh, the hegemons and infect places like France again and so on. Um, what about the democratic hegemon? The, I think that the hegemon uh, has inherently a dilemma. Um, on the one hand, um, mentally or culturally or um, there is this set of, there are this set of ideas about in favor of liberty and democracy uh, favored by the public opinion um, by the elite but on the other hand democracy at least in some under some conditions uh, may lead to instability and may lead to the construction of a revolutionary um, uh, regime or a regime that works against the hegemon. Um, and this, if we take seriously what I said about development, um, this is going to happen especially in poor countries. So in rich countries where you have a stable democracy and so on and so forth, this is not going to be one minute. Oh my God. Um, so because the world is unconstrained, the hegemon, probably the democratic hegemon is going to go for democracy. It's less concerned about all the question of instability and revolution. Um, if you have a constrained world with an authoritarian, the, sorry, in the constrained world with two or more uh, great powers, the authoritarian great power is going to follow, again, a pro-authoritarian strategy. In the case of the uh, democracy or democratic great power, the democratization dilemma leads to uh, probably a more, uh, less interest in democracy because uh, democracies, especially in poor countries, may lead to instability, which then may lead to those countries aligning with the opposite bloc, right? So this is, I think, is how we should interpret the Cold War and, in a way, today's uh, Middle East, where you have not a great power, but you have a middle power like Iran, 
that in a way is um, uh, unsettling everything and making things difficult to the US. Um, and then there are these situations where great powers are in cross-cutting alliances, so Russia, uh, Tsarist Russia with Democratic Republican France against uh, Germany and whatever. And in this time, these, normally these great powers do not invest any efforts in changing domestic institutions. So what is the, and I'm going to go fast over this, what is the impact of the international system when we look at this uh, with the data, right? This is uh, um, basically um, showing to you what is the impact of growth, again, from zero growth to 10% growth every year on an increase in democracy under an authoritarian order. When we look at the effect of development when you have a, a cross-cutting alliance world like the 19th century or a polarized world like the Cold War, there is some positive effect um, of income. But especially the impact of development becomes extremely high in a place where you only have democratic great, great powers. Then income is really uh, important. So there is some effect of uh, the pressing effect of certain types of international systems on the effects of development. To put it, and I, in, I only need 35 seconds, I think. Uh, to put it in a different way, this is looking at what is the probability of a democratic transition if the country was authoritarian for different levels of per capita income. Uh, and what is the, and I here what I distinguish is the, imp the effect of development on the probability of transition to democracy, if the country was allied with the USR, so the Soviet Union, uh, with the uh, allied with the US, so much higher probability of transition, and with the US during the Cold War. And it turns out that during the Cold War, the uh, effect of being allied with the US or the USSR uh, was kind of the same. It's only, the US has only been a democratic force or a force for the good when the old system collapsed after 1990. So, to finish, development I think matters for democracy. It both, I think, triggers and stabilizes democratic regimes, but the impact of development varies over time and leads to these sequences of booms and busts, and they are very strongly related to the international system. Thank you. Um, Professor Rice. Very interesting paper. And uh, I would just like to, to ask a question, though, about the very last point that you made, which yeah. was that you have to look to the post Cold War period to see the effect of America's view of the world that it ought to be democratic. Mm -hmm. um, no doubt that the end of one hegemon, the Soviet Union, the collapse of that system, and then throughout Eastern Europe, of course, you get democratization. Uh, but how then do you explain, after World War II, uh, a view that leads to a Japan that had never been de democratic despite high levels of economic development, a Germany that had in fact never been democratic despite high, level, high levels of, uh, of development, unless you explain it in terms of a world view of a constrained hegemon in the two hegemon world? So, um, so basically, you know, there are two periods in history where I would say there was a democratic, democratic hegemony. So one is 1990 and after. And the second, the other one is basically from 1918 till 1920 something, where the English, the British and the Americans basically are controlling the world. So we have two periods where this behavior happens, right? Then there is this moment uh, um, um, in, from 1940, uh, three till 1948 or 47, when in fact when the, the world was not a polarized uh, world, at least according to how I see it, but rather a place with cross-cutting alliances. So the Soviets at the, and the US till the Berlin uh, crisis were uh, collaborate, cooperating. So I think that this may explain in part a window of opportunity where um, there is an, the, the, the US invests or, or gets away with uh, uh, pushing for democracy in those countries. Um, of course, this is just, you know, about, it's about probabilities. I think that um, 
The other component, of, or, of course, is that the U.S. invaded and had the support of the whole population in the process of democratizing those countries. I think that this also matters enormously uh, to explain those two uh, exceptions. But again, you know, I'm just trying to get at the, 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 the architecture of things. And of course, there are all these possible exceptions. Uh, we have time for one very short question. Very, one very short response. So, um, cool. yeah. Just a very quick note on reframing the literature. Um, I don't think it's quite a case of development causing democracy versus democracy causing development. I mean, at least in the economics literature, it's, it's a fairly exhausted literature that now kind of says, well, you know, it's a bit of both simultaneously causing each other. And they've used instruments from settler mortality to distance from the equator and everything in between. And it's kind of moved to a sub-national level now. Um, and secondly, you, you presented progression results in a graph halfway through there, and you said it was robust to instrumentation. Can I ask you what instrumental variables you used? Uh, well, I used several instruments. I mean, this is a paper published in APSR last year, so I used... Uh, uh, a few things such as, in fact, I use instruments used by a paper on income and democracy, where the claim is that there is no causality. It turns out that you know, that instrument is not very robust when you uh, look at it statistically. I use genetic distance, and I, I, I use several instruments. But <laughs> I mean, this is gonna... uh, the, the literature on causation between development and democracy is, uh, you know, there are lots of parts to it. So I, it would require me to go over this many, but we can talk about this yeah. later. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> change lives, change lives, change organizations, change organizations, change the world.